The Bull Simons Award, named after the legendary Colonel Arthur Bull Simons, is presented annually by the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command as a Lifetime Achievement Award to those who embody the true spirit, values, and skills of the Special Operations Warrior. Tonight we honor a man whose career includes several combat operations and major Special Operations initiatives. His service to Special Operations, both in and out of uniform, spans more than 30 years. You know, as a, as a young kid, I, uh, my, everybody, that, every male in my family that I loved or respected either wore a herringbone twill or a, a police uniform. So uh, just about every male relative in my family, you know, starting with uh, long lost relatives who rode in the charge of the Light Brigade, you know, my great great grandfather who had fought in the, the Civil War, my grandfather who was with the American Expeditionary Force, you know, he had three sons. They're all in like World War II, Korea and Vietnam. So, so we, we, our family heritage, you know, spanned quite a bit of military action. Uh, so we, we were just, that's, we were a military family, I guess to put it simply. And uh, so there was no real doubt on what I was going to be. Yeah, the JSA was the, the, the furthest north camp. Uh, it was Camp Kitty Hawk at the time. I think it's now Camp Bonifias. But it was, uh, it was right at the uh, drop gate 128. So it was right at the southern edge of the military uh, uh, DMZ, the de, uh, demilitarized zone. I was put in charge of a, a combat unit that had a very unique mission. And so I quickly learned that whoever came into that unit, uh, because we had a very high turnover, given the fact that it was a hardship tour on the DMZ, and because we were face to face with North Koreans, uh, we had to work with a, uh, a, a no flaw mentality. What we call the Soviet defector incident uh, occurred on 23 November 1984. So Vasily Matuzak had planned this defection for a few years. He basically was part of a uh, tour group and not everybody, anybody could, from the north could come and tour Pama John because of the security risks and because of the risk of potential defection. Uh, he had asked one of the border, border guards, one of the North Korean border guards, to go down and take a picture uh, of him down on the MDL. And uh, we know this because it's a picture. Uh, he takes the North Korean kids picture first and uh, with the U.S. guys in the background. Uh, then, he, then they change over the camera and then uh, while the North Korean kid is taking his picture, uh, he, he bolts across the, uh, the military demarcation line. And uh, he runs through the, uh, the U.S. and the South Korean guard and says, I'm defecting. Matuzak runs across the border and as he relayed to me later, he was very surprised the North Koreans came after him. The North Korean kid, you know, he's in big trouble now because he just lost his charge. So he runs, uh, pulls his pistol and runs after him. Well, uh, our guys shoot him in the street because now you have a North Korean soldier in South Korea with a pistol drawn chasing a defector. Uh, and then after that, all hell breaks loose. I got a call from the talk. There was some firing. There was at least one man down and then some vague mention of a civilian, which didn't really make an impact on me at that point in time. So I basically told the quick reaction force to load trucks, which was our signal to get on board and start moving. So, uh, and everybody's looking at me because I'm, I'm the dude with the ranger tab. So, uh, hey, so what do we do? Yeah, they're, uh, they're actually in the sunken garden. So at the time we're, we're getting reports from the guys at checkpoint four that, uh, that they've got a, a large number of North Koreans in the sunken garden. And uh, so they're, they're basically pinned down. So now the mission changed from, uh, from secure the defector to, uh, to now secure the southern half of the, the Truce Village. He had his dismount and uh, he formed his own line and we went up to the JSA area. Uh, as we were cresting the hill, you could hear the uh, sonic cracks of the uh, bullets passing by. And of course at that time I didn't know that they were bullets. All I know is the leaves were moving, trees were losing bark and I was hearing that little sonic pop. When Lam and his squad kind of crashed into the North Korean flank and then moved around them. Uh, that bought Matuzak probably a few seconds until the time that we had a chance to get him out of there. You always want to have a proper mix of competence and professionalism and he, he led the charge. Uh, he inspired his soldiers to follow him and what can only be described as the most dangerous life or death situation. And uh, for all the right reasons, I think that his 
his aggressive maneuvering helped prevent the North Koreans who initially had more people than we did from continuing to pursue the defector. But despite a sustained aerial sweep of the area by U.S. Rangers, the militia controlled by Warlord General Ideed remains at large. The man himself has also evaded all attempts at capture and is believed to be responsible for the latest outrage. Latest reports from Mogadishu say seven Nigerian peacekeeping soldiers and 15 local civilians were killed in a shootout. The United States has now stationed 400 crack army rangers in the country to find Ideed. General Ideed has eluded capture since June when he went to ground after 24 Pakistani peacekeepers were killed in coordinated ambushes. We deployed to Mogadishu in late August of 1993 and our task is, our mission as far as Task Force Ranger was just to dismantle the Somali National Alliance leadership infrastructure. But we weren't there to provide security. Our mission was manhunting. We were going after Muhammad Farah Adid and all of his lieutenants. We're, we're, it's actually a Sunday, uh, 3 October was a Sunday, which traditionally had been a down day for the task force. Uh, idea was a uh, quick in, uh, secure the target, and then uh, quick, quick out. We launched on the mission at 1533 in the afternoon. Within minutes of conducting the air assault raid on the target building, the two lieutenants that we're going after were captured. And as we were getting ready to exfiltrate or to leave the, fur, the two Ranger platoons and the Special Forces assaulters that were on the target, as we were getting ready to leave the objective areas when the first Black Hawk got shot down. There was a large crowd to our north that there was a lot of shooting going on outside of the building. All of the Ranger positions were under direct small arms fire. Hand grenades were being thrown over the walls. We, everything was very, very close proximity as far as the fighting goes. Several of us raced a crowd to get to the crash site first, and we did, and we were able to successfully defend the crash site throughout the afternoon and into the entire evening. The convoy going back, as we listened to the debriefs afterwards, uh, was one, a, 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 a terrible firefight. Roger, I do have now, one where the convoy is riddled with RPGs and automatic weapons fire. Uh, they're losing, uh, losing individuals, you know, KIAs, having individuals wounded in action, and they're fighting their way back trying to get to the airfield. Once the, once the birds went down, then, uh, then we immediately scrambled a convoy. We tried to link up with the 10th Mountain. They were coming from the north of the city. We were coming up from the south. And, uh, and each, each element had got repulsed, so we had to turn around and come back. So I don't know if I could even paint the picture for you, but imagine five-ton trucks and Humvees coming out of the city. The sun is getting ready to go down. They've been ambushed the entire way back from the objective area back. They have prisoners that are wounded. They have American soldiers that are wounded and killed. The call then goes out by the commander to every able body ranger that is at the airfield to include the headquarters, the administrative guys, the clerks, the company clerks, the cooks, all of the staff personnel, everybody. Grab a rifle, we're gonna wash out the trucks and you're going back in the city to try to reinforce the objective. This is, this is the beauty of having someone like Rick Lamb in your formation. You know, a senior non-commissioned officer, uh, well experienced, uh, has been around, been around a bit, uh, not a stranger to firefights, uh, but at the same time, you, you know, are this, able to bring a steady, calming leadership uh, to a very chaotic situation, uh, dealing with young soldiers who have not seen this type of fighting previously. Uh, they've now seen their, their friends have been wounded or killed, and uh, we're asking them, get back in, get back in the, uh, get back in the fight, get back on these vehicles that didn't protect you the first time, and we need you to get out here and uh, move, move to a place where we can uh, affect a uh, rescue operation. It's tremendous leadership. And uh, ha again, having someone like Rick Lamb out there, that's exactly what you needed at the time. If you look into the eyes of the, of the kids that, uh, you know, was, I mean, they, they had just come back. I mean, you're inside the perimeter, you're safe, and you could just see, you know, the kind of the blood drain out of their face as they knew, we gotta go back out. And, uh, but it goes back to that Ranger Creed. 
But uh, you, know, you just look at them and say, listen guys, we knew this was going to be tough when we signed up. Uh, you motivate them a little bit. The first Humvee was a upgun Humvee with a machine gun and it would go through an intersection and, and sh shoot the corners of the intersection and all the smallies would get down and the second Humvee would come through and they would shoot and all the smallies would get down and then he'd come through. He said, I'd come through and all the smallies would jump up and they'd shoot t -t 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 -ting -ting -ting. and he said, it was crazy. What am I doing in the third Humvee? There was an RPG flash the, off to the right hand side. You could, uh, you could hear the guys in the back of the truck yelling RPG and uh, everything slowed down to the point where you could almost follow it with your eyes and uh, it hit in, the, uh, in the, the alleyway basically to my left. I kind of remember my head going back and uh, watching a spurt of blood go down and hit the, uh, hit the running lights on the, on the dashboard and I remember swearing under my breath going, damn it, I just got killed. And, uh, and everything, uh, everything went to like a white pristine point of light Everything got quiet. Uh, you know, I was almost, uh, almost feeling pretty good. You know, because you, you're, 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 you're wet, you're sweaty, you're, you're uh, it's noisy, it's stinky, and uh, and everything was just feeling kind of Nirvana-ish. And uh, and then I remember uh, just focusing on that white spot of light, and then thinking about my kid, thinking, man, I just had a kid. I just, uh, you know, what's going to happen to my wife? And then the next thing I remember, this guy's hitting me in the back of the helmet, going, don't stop here, don't stop here. He got to Walter Reed and they took a frontal x-ray and there was a, a thin gray line where that dot had been. He took a side view and it was like a, a razor blade, triangular razor blade had gone straight into his head and right between the lobes in his brain. And he, uh, the doctor told him, you know what, I'm good enough to get that out, but I wouldn't have been good enough to put that in. I'm telling you right now, and I wish I could tell everybody this, is if it wasn't for what the ground vehicles did, if the ground vehicles, the Malaysians and the Americans, 10th Mountain Division and Rick's convoy, if they, had, if they had not persisted, if they had not made it, we would not have survived at the crash site. I know of, uh, of no person that, that I would put ahead of him in terms of being a, a soft warrior his whole life, a person of character and integrity his whole life. I spent 20 plus years in the military. I saw a lot of non-commissioned officers and there are a few of them that stick out very easily in my memory as some of the best. And Rick is absolutely one of them. But so I think Rick Lamb epitomized the, uh, the aggressive warrior spirit that we needed there, but was also tempered by just being a true professional, he knew what the, what the boundaries were. You know that there are others out there that if you don't go to them, if you don't step forward, uh, they're going to die. And what you see here is you see Rick Lamb, who takes the uh, fear that had to be probably within the formation, and probably his own personal, personal fear, overcome that through leadership and uh, get this force out back out onto the, uh, back into the fight. What I seen him do there in that firefight uh, and, and what he influenced me to stand by him and do the same thing, expose ourselves as we did, you tell me how good of a leader he was. I followed him. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bull Simons Award winner for 2015 Command Sergeant Major Richard Lamb.